So I will now turn to our discussion for today. I have the great honor to give the floor to Jamila Rakip. Jamila serves as the executive director of the Albert Einstein Institution. She joined Jean Sharp and the Albert Einstein Institute in 2002, focusing on the promotion and the distribution of writings and translations on the technique of nonviolent struggles and its potential in acute conflicts worldwide. In 2009, she collaborated with Dr. Sharp to create a new curriculum entitled Self-Liberation, a Guide for Strategic Planning for Action to End a Dictatorship or Other Oppression. Uh, I also have to say that her TED Talk on Nonviolent Action has received more than 1 million views, which is very impressive. So Jamila, um, over to you and we look forward to your insights. Thank you so much, Veronique, and thank you all uh, for being here today. Thank you so much also to Michael for inviting me uh, to join this conversation, which comes at such an incredibly important time uh, for our shared work, uh, especially as so many of us are sort of thinking about what this next phase uh, of our work looks like and how we can sort of better meet the needs of people who are seeking resources and capabilities and knowledge that can help them to conduct their struggles more effectively. So I want to use the time I have uh, to sort of look at some of the, the global trends um, and, and, and really talk about how Michael's book uh, connects uh, with those trends and, and, and with those efforts uh, to advance the field. We're in a moment of great challenge as communities around the world are facing multiple crises uh, that I don't have to probably share with this group, but the growing authoritarianism, uh, climate change, economic and racial inequality, uh, just to name a few. But in the midst of all of this, we're also in a moment of opportunity uh, for this work because as these crises are taking place, so also are people in every country in the world organizing and uh, fighting back in incredibly innovative and powerful ways. I think it's this global phenomenon that offers us great hope, um, grounds for hope, and also insight to carry our work forward. And I think it's this that, that Michael's book is tapping into, right? That we have so much to learn from people themselves who are often organizing under very difficult circumstances, uh, often against opponents that are very powerful and well-resourced and who are themselves uh, adapting and innovating. So it's also this understanding that I think motivated and helped fuel uh, Jean Sharp's early foundational work and, and really the creation of the original 198 methods. The idea that there's a lot that we can learn from people themselves who have been experimenting with nonviolent action for centuries. So for the past few years, uh, excuse me, for the past few months and, and probably years too, I've been helping organize uh, Jean's archival material, which goes back to the 1950s. It's, it's quite, a, quite a task. Um, and it's really in the 1950s when Jean first started collecting uh, methods. And I recently came across the um, index cards and little bits of paper that he was using to kind of note down from the historical accounts he was studying. He was like noting down, you know, when he discovered a new method, which of course he was not really inventing or discovering. He was just documenting it. So Gene told me about the first time that he shared the list with people. Uh, it was 1960, he was a student at Oxford. Um, and at this point he had been collecting the methods for probably close to a decade. And he said that, you know, he had 32 methods documented with their definitions and their, you know, historical examples of their use. And he presented this list um, at a decolonization conference in Ghana called the Positive Action for Peace and Security in Africa. I also just found the pamphlets from, from the original conference. So he described how he presented this list and you know, how excited people were. You know, he said that they stayed up all night discussing the list, thinking about how it applies uh, and studying it, really amazed that there were 32 things that you could do. And of course, we know there's a lot more than 32 things that you can do. And in a way, I think Gene's, you know, 198 methods was probably out of date as soon as it was published. 
Um, and I think he knew that, you know, he stopped at 200, he could have eaten, and he stopped at 198, though he could have easily rounded up to 200 at least. But I always suspected that he did that, uh, you know, to show that the list was incomplete. Um, and that really it was human imagination and creativity that would invite people, uh, you know, to, to, to add to the list, to invent new methods, and to use old methods in, in new ways in the midst of a, a constantly evolving world. So tactical innovation is nothing new. We're seeing it, though, take place in the world today at an unprecedented level uh, for the reasons that, that Michael uh, outlined uh, in the book such as the availability of, of new technology and digital organizing tools, as well as like the inclusion of a lot of the new methods that use art and music and poetry uh, and, and other forms of expression and, and cultural resistance. So I've been, you know, observing the spread of resources uh, on nonviolent action for, for a couple of decades almost now. And I've seen how specifically the knowledge of the methods is so empowering for people um, because it demonstrates that there's this whole, you know, repertoire of actions from which they can draw to conduct their struggles. And also that there's a whole world of activists and organizers that are experimenting with this stuff, right? That they don't have to reinvent the wheel, that, you know, they're not alone that you know, they can learn from, from other people's experimentation and, and not their own, which is often very costly. Um, and also that they don't always have to go to the kind of, you know, the, 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 the go-to methods, right? Street demonstrations, which can often be risky and which are you know, often symbolic and on their own, which does do very little to shift power that is necessary to actually succeed. So an understanding of the range of methods is also important. You know, I think this is also what, what Michael's book is helping to do is really, you know, uh, communicate the important, uh, it, it, it's, it, it meets an important requirement for strategic planning. So it enables people to select methods that better fit their context, um, that better reflect their cultures, that are more consistent with the level of risk that they're willing to take and that they're prepared to take uh, and the repression that they have the capacity to withstand, uh, just to name a few of the factors that need to be considered when selecting methods for a campaign uh, or struggle. And that's what we mean by strategy, right? Uh, you know, how can people select methods that better fit their context and then more effectively contribute to their objectives? Uh, in order to raise the chances that the movement will achieve its objectives. So I also just want to point to another important area that I think Michael's book addresses, and that's the way in which nonviolent action, I think, you know, Michael, you talked about this, uh, how it's increasingly overlapping with traditional, you know, uh, uh, approaches or other approaches, human rights law and advocacy, you know, the guerrilla lawyering, uh, yeah, strategic litigation that we're seeing Obviously, we know movements don't operate in a vacuum. They're influenced by a wider ecosystem that connects to international human rights law, peace building, traditional political action, advocacy. And these movements themselves influence these systems and people and institutions. So this ecosystem approach, I think, is really important for people who are devising strategies that operate in the real world um, and that, you know, actually reflect the environment in which they're going to be implemented. Um, so, you know, we've seen recently how exciting it is that, you know, our field of civil resistance is, you know, really reaching out to related fields and how also other fields are very open to understanding how we can, uh, you know, um, collaborate in ways uh, that can that can benefit the people that we're trying to reach and that can really improve all of our work. So I'll just say, uh, you know, before I wrap up uh, that something that I've been sort of alluding to, but which I think is a really important contribution of the book uh, and the database and, and all the sort of efforts like it. And that's really the way in which it decentralizes, you know, how we collect knowledge, uh, generate it, and, and how we share it, you know, given the scale of the demand for resources and trainings and knowledge about nonviolent action in the world, 
uh, and also what we know about this incredible level, you know, community level of innovation and learning that's currently not being adequately captured. I think this is precisely what's needed, right? This decentralization is what's needed to advance and refine our understanding uh, of what people are doing globally, uh, what's working, what's not working, and how we can better share that knowledge with people who can benefit from it. Uh, and I think it's this approach that's going to allow us to better really harness the wisdom we know is in our communities uh, and, and better capture the learning and innovations that, are, that we know are taking place uh, in our world today. So there's a lot at stake here, we all know that, um, because ultimately, I think what resources like this and um, do is, is, is really foster hope, uh, which I think we so desperately need, um, and without which nothing, you know, none of this is possible. Um, and, that, and that hope comes from knowing, you know, what's been achieved and what's being achieved around the world through people's bravery and creativity, and that's all very empowering. Um, I think it helps spark people's imagination uh, and, and uh, gives them insight that can help overcome their helplessness and enable to both you know, fight oppression, but also build the kind of societies that better reflect the values in their communities.